let's get going then. So I'd just like to begin with a welcome to country. I'd like to acknowledge that I am on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Dr Emma Carmody. I'm a special counsel with the Environmental Defenders Office and I've worked for the EDO for the last oh, nine years, including two maternity leaves. So I think that's seven intellectual years. Uh, I'm also legal advisor to the Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands and on a couple of different water related boards, but decided that I uh, would veer left and start looking at regulatory barriers to green economic stimulus. And I'll talk a little bit about the genesis of this webinar series in a moment. But before I do, I just thought I'd briefly um, explain the process. People can ask questions. If you could just put them in the chat box, we'll keep an eye on those and we'll do our best to address them throughout if possible or at the end. With the last webinar we ran, some people asked some very interesting questions, for example, about uh, green hydrogen. We didn't get a chance to address them, but we did talk about them in a subsequent article, which I co-wrote with the presenters as part of that energy webinar. And we published that um, in the EDO's Bulletin Insight. So we may do that again. So if your question isn't, isn't addressed, apologies, but we'll try and get to it in a written form afterwards. So without further ado, ado, I'll describe the background or the, the, the genesis of this webinar. Um, I'm obviously delighted to be hosting it on behalf of the EDO. And this particular webinar will be examining um, regulatory barriers within the context of corporations law and superannuation law that may inhibit green economic stimulus. And we'll also be discussing opportunities for reform, which is always the most interesting and exciting aspect of these kinds of discussions. And we're very fortunate to have experts to share their insights. So it's the second in a series of webinars that are being run by the EDO, and each is examining regulatory barriers within a specific area of law and policy, which may inhibit green economic stimulus, which is so important at this particular juncture in time. So the genesis for the series is really quite simple. I observed a couple of months ago that many think tanks, conservation groups, economists, and in fact, entire economic blocks, the EU, as many of you would know, were publishing and promoting really interesting and visionary blueprints for green economic stimulus. However, very few are actually examining possible regulatory barriers and the kinds of reform that might be required to lift those barriers to allow these ambitious plans to be um, implemented. I also realised, and it's strange that it didn't occur to me earlier, that when most people think of environmental law, they think of laws that directly govern biodiversity, nature or natural resources in a very direct way. However, I'm sure you'd all agree that energy policy, corporations law, superannua superannuation law, taxation law, all of these very complex um, areas of law and policy are hugely determinative of how our environment is managed or conversely mismanaged. And they all influence the extent and speed at which we can decarbonise our economy, which is obviously crucial. So nowhere does this seem more obvious than within the context of superannuation law. When I was researching this subject, and I have to admit I'm, um, I'm an absolute beginner, which is why we have experts joining me here today. But when I was researching this, I discovered that by June 2020, Australians had $2.7 trillion invested in superannuation, which makes Australia the fourth largest holder of pension assets in the world, which is pretty phenomenal given our small population. So I think you'll agree, this is an absolutely staggering amount of money. And it's arguably a powerful tool to drive social and environmental change. However, it's my understanding that a relatively small percentage of this money is actually invested ethically, broadly speaking, or specifically in green projects. So as part of this webinar, we're going to be exploring what needs to change to ensure that a greater percentage of this money is directed toward combating climate change, biodiversity loss, water conservation, and so on. So the people who are going to teach us about that are our three experts. So I'm going to hand over to them to introduce themselves. Uh, I'll start with Kirsten. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining and thanks, Emma, for setting this up. 
My name is Kirsten Hunter. I am the Managing Director at Future Super, which um, is a strongly for-purpose superannuation fund that is uh, uh, using the power of money to invest, advocate and campaign for a future worth retiring into. My background before joining Future Super was as a lawyer, so these kinds of topics around regulatory reform are very close to my heart, and then as a management consultant. Thank you. Phil. Uh, Phil Vernon. Um, I was, up until last year, uh, CEO of Australian Ethical Investment, um, which is an ethical superannuation fund and investment company, similar to Future Super. Uh, and since then, uh, I'm on various boards, um, Environmental Defenders Office being one of them, um, which is a fantastic team. And thank you, Emma, for setting this up. Pleasure. Um, and uh, Beyond Zero Emissions as well, uh, who have just recently done a report that Emma alluded to, uh, of the nature that Emma alluded to, um, demonstrating that uh, you know, the post-COVID recovery uh, can be green and can generate um, uh, growth and employment. Um, I'm also involved uh, in an organisation called Futurity, which is a um, uh, APRA regulated financial services organisation, so still involved in, uh, in that sort of environment. Great, thank you. And over to Tim Gordon, our corporations law guru. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you uh, for having me as well. Um, I feel like I'm probably the least well credentialed member of the panel. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm a partner in Gilbert and Tobin in the corporate advisory team. I do um, MA capital raisings, which we'll get into today, and also a particular interest in corporate governance. Um, so I'm very thrilled to be involved. Thank you. Well, we're absolutely delighted to have the three of you here. Thank you so much for giving us your time. So, should we get into the questions? Let's do it. So the first one, we'll start with superannuation. And um, these are questions to start with for Phil and Kirsten. So the superannuation system in Australia is one of the largest sources of capital and that figure $2.7 trillion amply illustrates that fact. And it's my understanding that it will only continue to grow. So if we're to address climate change, an enormous amount of this capital arguably needs to shift into low carbon investments in a relatively short period of time. So just to set the scene, Phil, if you wouldn't mind briefly explaining to our audience the legislative and regulatory regime, and this will help us to delve into some of the barriers that we'd like to address. Sure. Um, I might uh, also just um start before I, uh, I delve into the, uh, the different aspects of the legislation, just sort of touch on a, key, uh, a few key themes. Probably uh, one, um, if I could just sort of frame uh, how uh, I sort of think about the system uh, and the market, and this applies to both um, superannuation and also the discussion when we go into the corporations law and companies as well. Um, but I sort of describe this as being um, uh, there's four levels of commitment um, that uh, toward climate um, that we can sort of uh, categorize organizations into. Um, one is you know no commitment, um, so not taking climate change into account at all. Uh, the next category is uh, the uh, you know, broadly speaking, the ESG uh, cohort. Um, and that is organisations or super funds that consider uh, environmental and social issues generally, but in the context of climate, climate change, um, as a, a means of uh, analysing the financial returns. Um, so still the financial returns dominate, um, but uh, climate change is relevant to that and considered as an input to that. Um, I guess the fourth category, to just jump over the third one, uh, the fourth category is the world, world of ethical investment. That is, and I broadly describe it as being investing the way that we think the world should be. Um, so you know, getting from here to there in, in one fell swoop. Um, and then there's probably a third category, uh, and I think that's where uh, I'm really interested in uh, 
I think a lot of the conversation focusing around, and that is um, in, in particularly in respect to climate. Um, e, it's effectively ESG, but with specific targets mm -hmm. uh, around addressing climate change. It's, it's effectively a little bit of a mix between ESG and ethical. Um, and it's uh, potentially where the, the big solution is. Uh, and potentially where a lot of the uh, debate and um, uh, confusion, in my view, uh, probably sits, but potentially where the, where the largest opportunity is. Um, I guess there's a couple of other sort of themes that sort of permeate the discussion. Um, and those themes, and you know, these will potentially come, uh, come up a number of times as we work through the issues. Um, but really thinking about, you know, th when we're thinking about uh, climate risk uh, and the impact of climate, um, the difference between, um, you know, the impact of climate uh, on the entity that we're considering, um, and that's where a lot of the discussion is. Um, but then there's a, a step beyond that, and that is, uh, and, and this is where the real solution uh, lies, and that is the impact that the entity that we're responsible for is actually having on the climate. They're, they're quite obviously related, um, climate being the, 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 the linker, but they're actually quite two different conversations and they often get confused. Um, there's a real question about the role of superannuation and whether or not um, it has uh, what I tend to call a normative role to play. Um, or is simply the passive chaser of investment returns. Uh, and there's a, a, probably a theme of, um, you know, obligation uh, versus permission under the law that I think is really interesting to explore. Um, but I might uh, come back to those themes in later discussion. Um, just to sort of then talk about the, uh, yeah, the legislative framework. Um, the uh, within superannuation, I guess you know probably there's you know there's three uh, areas of the legislative uh, framework that's relevant to to this discussion. One is the sole purpose test, uh, so section sixty two, um, which is uh, uh, basically says that you know the sole purpose of um, the superannuation uh, is to provide retirement benefits. Um, can, I, can I just ask, Phil, I'm so sorry to sure. interrupt. Could you just tell people which piece of legislation you're talking to? Some people might want to know that, if that's okay. Sure. So superannuation is governed by the superannuation, uh, what does the I stand for, Kirsten? Anyway, it's the, it's the super. It's the CIS Act. The CIS that, Act, yeah. Yes, they go on superannuation. Yeah. So section sixty-two of, um, of the CIS uh, Act. Of the CIS Act. Yeah. Uh, is the sole purpose test. Okay. Um, it's a. It, it's the clause. It, it's a clause that says that superannuation is there to provide retirement benefits. Um, when we're talking about. Uh, uh, investing in relation to climate it's often uh, it's often used as a reason why it's it's difficult to take uh, non-financial matters into account because the sole purpose of superannuation is to invest for return uh, retirement so there's a question as to whether you are obliged to simply maximize um, you know your sole purpose is to care about investment returns um, and to and that somehow precludes you from uh, taking other factors into account, such as uh, climate targets, etc. Uh, then the uh, other key section uh, of the CIS Act is Section 52 um, that gets debated around these issues, and that is the, the uh, best interest duty of trustees. So superannuation funds. Uh, are governed by boards of trustees uh, and the responsibilities are outlined in section 52. Specifically, uh, section 52.2 um, is the best interest duty. 
Now, this is a, um, the main point of debate in relation to this one is uh, what does best interests mean? Is it best financial interests? And even beyond that, does it mean that you have an obligation to maximise the financial interests um, as opposed to an alternative view that it's a due process duty um, we're all about avoiding conflict of interest. Um, and it doesn't necessarily infer that you are obliged to chase the maximum return possible. Uh, and so therefore, where it's often used is uh, as a reason why certain sectors, for example, can't be avoided because you're somehow doing the wrong thing by your members uh, by not giving, by not having access to you know, the maximum opportunity available. So that's another section that um, uh, quite often comes up in the climate debate. And then the third one is, um, sorry, then there's another section of 52, which is 52.6, which talks about uh, the investment duties um, that you're required to uh, invest um, according uh, to a well-diversified portfolio having um, uh, good liquidity and other factors that you need to take into account when framing an investment governance framework. Uh, and then there's a whole series of guidance notes um, and the most relevant one is uh, SPG 530, uh, which is the investment governance um, guidance note uh, that uh, aims to, it has a number of aspects to it but it's uh, largely to clarify uh, 52.6, the investment governance uh, um, requirements. And it also tries to address the issue of ESG uh, and in fact ethical. Um, unfortunately, its current drafting is a little bit ambiguous uh, and it doesn't actually uh, serve the purposes that it's trying to get to. Uh, and maybe we can come back to that. So that's largely the, the, the sort of the, the key area, the key framework, sole purpose test section 62, the best interest duty section 52, um, and uh, SPG 530. Thanks, Phil, for that introduction. That's been really useful. And I think it's set the scene for people who are listening and who don't have a deep understanding of how superannuation regulation works. And you've set out basically four barriers, three embedded in the legislation, and the fourth is the guidance notes and a certain amount of ambiguity about how you interpret certain things. Kirsten, um, I'd be really grateful if you could talk to some of those points, those barriers, and what you might do to change them, uh, how hard you think that is, and whether there are any other barriers you'd like to raise and how you'd address those. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one I think that has the far greatest impact as a barrier today is the the first one that Phil mentioned, the sole purpose test. Mm -hmm. um, so that's in in the CIS Act, and I did put it in the chat for everyone who's a legal uh, nerd and wants to look it up afterwards for some good bedtime reading. It's the Superannuation <laughs> Industry Supervision Act. Uh, we'll put you to sleep. Yeah, but please industry. enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, but um, the sole purpose test really was designed originally and the way it's worded is to um, to address conflicted remuneration. So it's designed to stop investment managers making investment decisions in order to get a personal kickback. It's designed to stop SMS fund uh, managers from, say, investing in pieces of art and calling it an investment when actually the art just sits on the wall of the SMSF holder. So in nowhere in the sole purpose test does it say that um, investment has to be made specifically to deliver financial benefits for members in retirement? It specifically says benefits in retirement. Um, but this provision is really weaponized by many in the industry who don't want to consider ethical factors when they're making investment decisions. Um, and so, you know, Phil sort of spoke to this, but um, it's something that I come up against time and time again as an ethical player in this space. And Phil, I'm sure that you have had more than your fair share of conversations about the sole purpose test as well. But every panel, every industry event that I go to where I'm representing Future Super and, um, you know, our mandate is to show that you can invest ethically and deliver great benefits for members, people will, um, will ask, well, how can you do that when taking into account the sole purpose test? Mm. So, and someone's just asked that in the chat, sorry, effectively. 
sorry to interrupt. I just thought. Yeah, no, no problem. Already. There you go. Perfect example. Um, but I mean, the sole purpose test, it specifically is designed to stop conflicted remuneration. It does speak to investment decisions have to be made for the sole purpose of delivering benefits for members in their retirement. But what is a benefit in retirement? It's not just money. It has to consider the world that's going to exist at the time that you're old enough to access that money and be able to spend it. And so we take a fairly broad view of the sole purpose test. Um, we don't put money over the environmental outcomes, we put them side by side. Mm -hmm. um, and the really great thing about ESG investing is that the data shows year after year um, that uh, funds that are invested with strong ESG considerations, so that's environmental, social and governance considerations at that core, do outperform the benchmark. And you know, I have to say now, past performance is not a reliable indicator of future performance, but the data is stacking up to show that historically, funds that do consider environmental, social and governance factors do perform better or have performed better historically. Mm -hmm. And so as an ethical manager, you can put those two things side by side, side by side. And it is a balancing process to weigh up how you're thinking about the environmental outcomes of the investment decisions that you're making, as well as the financial outcomes that you're delivering for members. As far as reform goes, I mean, I feel like a provision that is um, widely uh, used in a way that is taken outside the initial context in which it was proposed, there's, it should be a very simple process to tighten up the wording in that provision and to make it clearer the way it is uh, designed to operate. I mm -hmm. think there's also some positive inclusions that I would love to see, uh, particularly around superannuation, which is a long-term investment, um, to talk about the fact that, uh, you know, like it isn't just about the money that Mm. investment managers as they are thinking about how to make decisions that deliver benefits for members in retirement that that question of what is a benefit takes in more than just the amount of interest that's going to accrue, accrue mm -hmm. or the amount of returns that are delivered to that mm -hmm. member over the course of that investment period. So Kirsty if I've correctly understood essentially the sole purpose test doesn't from a strictly legal perspective it doesn't really inhibit fund managers trustees from investing in the way you do with your fund but for various reasons, they interpret it really narrowly and it could be useful to amend it to make it very clear to more traditional trustees and fund managers that yeah, that, absolutely. Is, that, that, that actually you can take climate change into account. But to take it one step further, do you think there's utility in int introducing a positive duty into the Act? I 100% I do. Um, and again, the reason for that is because superannuation is a long term investment. We are managing our members money for 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 years while they're still working. And as a responsible manager looking to the retirement outcomes that that member is going to have by the time they're old enough. I think those factors, the long term environmental impacts should be a relevant consideration to the way we manage our members money. And yeah. I think as well, the economic impacts of those long-term environmental trends um, should be something that superannuation managers in particular should be forced to take into account when they're making investment decisions. Do you think that there's any appetite within the government to introduce a positive duty? Uh, I haven't seen a lot of appetite within the government. Certainly there are, within the industry groups, there are uh, a number of sort of uh, task forces task forces and working groups looking at regulatory change. The Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative um, is a really big one that's sort of within the industry and looking at different um, elements. I know, for example, there is, uh, I'm not sure, Phil, you probably have a better answer to this than me, but there is a, a sort of please explain requirement for funds that do take into account ESG considerations to show how those considerations don't conflict with the um, the the obligation to provide financial outcomes to members, but looking at sort of reversing that. So instead of please explain why you're taking these considerations into account, it would be please explain why you are not taking these considerations into yeah. account. Yeah, okay. We, we're, we're going to talk a little bit later on about the role that test cases and litigation could play if the government's not willing to amend the Act to make it explicitly clear that trustees need to... Um, consider climate change amongst other environmental factors, then maybe litigation has a role to play in pushing the boundaries. We'll talk about that a bit later. But I thought um, right now we'll transition over to Tim and have a little chat about corporations law. So Tim, during the course of my research, um, and that included written research and also talking to different experts, yourself included, 
I was really surprised to encounter a range of views regarding the extent to which corporations law in Australia inhibits company directors from making decisions on the basis of environmental outcomes. So for example, some people who I spoke to thought that the law needed to be redrafted, corporations law needed to be redrafted to actively require directors to consider the environment and other social impacts and not just profit. And conversely, other people said, well, they're actually of the view, similar to the sole purpose test and what you were saying, Kirsten, they're of the view that actually the law is fine. So the, the barriers are less legal and they're more attitudinal. Um, so as an expert in, in corporations or as someone who's dealing with very large companies day in, day out, what's your view on this kind of binary? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I mean, it's really fascinating. Just to quickly riff off what Kristen said, I mean, the the requirement to explain why it's appropriate to take into account ESG in a super context runs completely counter to where the jurisprudence and the regulatory views are going in a company context. So I feel it. I find it that that narrow view in super land seems to be, at least to me, increasingly unsustainable um, in a way that would be encouraging, I think, to the people on this panel. But just to stick to companies and what I actually know about. I mean, in Australia, if you take a step back, the relevant driver is director's duties. And the relevant director's duties here are duty to act in the best interest of the company and director's duties of care and diligence. And I think those duties at the moment, my view, do a reasonable job when sort of properly understood to discourage companies from engaging in harmful practices. Um, probably don't do much for specifically positive, impactful decision making where that may come at some sort of short term shareholder cost. And I won't sort of drill into that a little, but the, um, the duty to act in the best interest of the company has historically, until relatively recently, been more or less to be understood to be act in the best interest of shareholders. And what does that mean? That means shareholder return um, really should be over a medium to long term, but the way that um, shareholder primacy has become kind of understood, but also weaponized by the powers that actually are given to shareholders, um, has led to, had led to a view that that's relatively short term shareholder returns. There have been a couple of big changes, I think, in Australia, at least, to the way that duty is being understood with respect to the types of stuff we're talking about today. Um, the Noel Hutley opinion from 2016, which we might talked about a little bit more detail, really got on the radar of a lot of people that um, failing to um, consider, disclose, mitigate um, environmental risk to the extent it has a tangible impact on your business could, in fact, be a breach of director's duties. That um, was pretty controversial at the time and certainly got a lot of press. But it's funny, I think a lot of regulatory change that has happened since then can really be threaded back to that um, opinion. And so since, I think that was 2016, since 2016, it's seen a pretty coordinated effort by ASIC, APRA, the RBA, ASX to get at least climate change, mitigation, disclosure on the agenda for big companies. Um, and really the other thing that doesn't feel like it should be so related, but was, was the Financial Services Royal Commission where Ken Hayne in his final report was pretty scathing on the concept of the sort of weaponized shareholder primacy view of the world. So essentially what he said was, Australian companies are under the obligation to act in the best interest of the company, the best interest of a wide group of shareholders, of stakeholders, including the environment um, and shareholders, starts to coalesce if you take a long-term view and a long-term view of the interest of the company is, is really what you need to be doing to discharge your duties. Mm. So I think where that has led us to now is that climate change um, consideration, disclosure, but to the extent that you can tangi sort of tangibly relate it to your own business is on the agenda. And so I think that is helpful um, and certainly has been a pretty dramatic change in the interpretation of a director's duties in Australia. Whether or not it's driving substantially positive outcomes yet, probably hard to say, um, but it's on the agenda. But I think, Emma, some of the people that would have said to you, we need change, they'd be thinking about a couple of different things. One would be, in the UK, for example, they have this concept of what's called enlightened shareholder value, which is a pretty similar duty baseline to what we have here. 
but they go on to expand in their in their act that um, in acting in the best interest of the company, you need to have regard to some certain things. And it talks about employees, stakeholders. It actually talks about the environment. It doesn't mean you're obliged to favour the environment over shareholder return, mm -hmm. but it sort of puts in writing that's one of the things you need to think about if you're a responsible director acting in the interest of your company. My personal view is that would be controversial here, but I think it's I think it's good. I think it's helpful, and I think it isn't a major departure from what is actually good governance practice here. So I think that would be useful. Then there's a spectrum where you get onto different corporate structures, things like benefit corporations and these kind of things that hardwire in a more positive duty to have regard for things other than shareholder value. Um, I think those structures are great, but I personally don't think that they move the dial in Australia on positive investment or positive action to stimulate kind of green economic growth because at least my view is um, if you wanted to do those things now and you wanted to start a company to do it you could do it fine with our current corporate structures mm -hmm. but there are other regulations um, under corporate law in Australia that make it hard to raise money and hard to do innovative things at a kind of cost effective way and so I think those things probably and I'll come on to them a little later probably harm innovation yes um, in a way that I don't think a B Corp or that kind of structure, which I think are really valuable, and they'd probably be great to have in the armory. But I don't think the existence of a different corporate structure solves some of the problems around the regulation of kind of risk taking right. in this space. So it's the capital raising. You're talking about laws that yeah. or relate to capital raising, and that's what you'll talk about a bit later. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we'll talk about it later, but you know, the the requirements for financial service licensing, the requirements for disclosure around capital raisings. They're hard, they're complicated, and they're probably not um, kind of economically feasible for people to take speculative punts on the kind of green initiatives um, that need to be proven up. And so I think that there's a case to be made for streamlining and simplifying regulation around areas of investment that we consider to be a national priority and sort of worth um, worth simplifying and worth streamlining to just give the people a chance to throw a bit more spaghetti against the wall on that stuff. Well, streamlining is certainly an important part of our government's lexicon. So we just need to keep reinforcing that word. It's a regular yeah. barrier with streamline, but we'll talk about that in more detail. That's extremely interesting and it wasn't something I was conscious of. And it's indeed why we've got you here to educate us all about uh, possible regulatory barriers. But before we come back to that, you um, referred to the Hutley opinion and then spoke about the interface between director's duties and climate change, which was really the substance of what his opinion was about. Um, for people who aren't familiar with that, Noel Hutley SC is an eminent barrister. And as Tim said, he, in 2016, wrote a legal opinion about that issue. And it sounds like, Tim, what you're saying is that it's been very influential and in fact had a ripple on effect and the regulator has started to change its approach, which is quite, I mean, that's very powerful. Unbelievably powerful. I mean, you know, ASIC, for example, had a task force going just before COVID really hit, so call it kind of late 2019, that I think went on pause where they were essentially investigating the practices of major companies in Australia, sort of ASX 100 companies, around the consideration and disclosure of climate risk in the light of their duty of care and diligence, so director's duties of care and diligence. I mean, that idea was completely new, really, um, wow. when Hutley put it out there. I mean, not new so much, but not accepted by um, the mainstream of corporate directors in Australia, that there would be a sort of real risk of a breach of care and diligence around managing of what seems like a you know big picture climate change type issues. And, and not to say that it's the number one risk that company directors sit around thinking about at the moment but it is as a matter of fact since that opinion came out in 2016 you have APRA, ASIC, RBA, ASX all talking about this stuff putting it in guidance notes putting it in regulatory communications and it is a an issue that's around the board table now and, and ASIC equally has really ramped up its focus on companies management of non-financial risks and I mean I mean APRA says that it is a financial risk and it, it clearly is but um you know, this is the kind of thing that um, that Hutley was talking about, and, and now it's relatively mainstream. And I think sometimes it's a good example, and it sort of goes back, I think, to what Phil and Christian were saying in a way, is that we don't always need new laws. We sometimes just need better ideas. And, and the Australian director's duty regime is pretty blunt compared to a lot of the rest of the world. But 
it was interpreted in a compelling way, which drew the link and sort of made people ask the question of whether they feel comfortable with their level of disclosure and their investment strategies. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about managing people's money over the long term, and I just think it's a terrific idea of where people kind of put their mind to um, considering a, a risk within the existing framework. And that is sort of fundamentally, it's, we're not the whole way there, but it's fundamentally changed disclosure practice and um, board level consideration around these issues. But, but I do think it, to the overreaching theme of this panel, Emma, it really goes to the minimising harm rather than the doing good. Um, and so there's still further reforms that could be done, I think, to help um, people who want to get on and do good rather than just big companies now trying to minimise risk and harm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's absolutely fascinating. And that's a very short space of time, uh, four years for that change to have occurred. And it, it seems to reinforce my own working theory that in Australia, you've kind of got this pincer effect. You've got activism at one end of the spectrum and business at the other, and you've kind of got the government in the middle often lagging behind. The Hartley opinion, really, even though he's an eminent silk, it, it was it's a it was a form of advocacy and activism, um, yeah. if you will. And then businesses responded. Well, the regulator as well, to be fair, from what you're saying. But the law in the middle, Parliament hasn't actually changed the law, so no. if the executive hasn't changed anything per se, Parliament hasn't changed anything, but it, at sort of either end of the spectrum, so I put my hands a bit higher, I'm just gesticulating below the camera. Yeah. You've got the kind of two, these two kind of forces that are coming together. Um, yeah. Does that sort and, of and he, and, oh, It does, absolutely. And, and I think what was quite, yes, absolutely. And I think what was compelling was viewing climate change through essentially a financial risk matrix. And so, you know, that's something that directors, their, their number one role is to be stewards of companies. And the issue was framed around, um, you know, in exercising your duty as a steward of the company, which has always been the way that directors are sort of very traditional view of directors duties, is that this is a risk that should be on your radar and you should be talking about. And, you know, it came from a big end of town silk and it really cut through, I think, in that way. And the, the, um, the, the ramifications are really clear and in a really short space of time. Quite, quite. I've just got a quick question for you, Tim, before I hand over to Phil, because he's got a question about the Hartley opinion as well. So someone here has asked, do you run across shareholder primacy issues within the context of the Corporations Act at the fund management level? Um, yes. So, I mean, I think that directors are often criticised for um, engaging in behaviour that is, call it shareholder primacy type behaviour so favouring um, the short-term interests of shareholders. But you actually have to look at the settings of our Corporations Act, and this will take, I can go way off topic on this, Emma, so I won't, but, but the, the, where legislators in Australia have wanted to keep companies honest and to introduce oversight, they've tended to do that by um, increasing the powers available to shareholders. Uh, and that sort of makes sense for, from an agency management perspective, uh, um, the agency problem of companies and shareholders and managers. but um, the best uh, friend of long-termism is not always fund manager shareholders who've got more powers to boot out directors to call meetings um, and to um, otherwise apply pressure to directors to do things that potentially have financial benefit in the short term. And so one thing I do think is important with regulatory guidance and law reform is that actually directors themselves in some respects are given more rope to act in the best interests of the company over a longer term. Because if you're a director who wants to take a long-term view, but it's, not going to, it's going to take 10, 15, 20 years for that to really pay off, you do think you can make the case. Mm. Then at the moment, you still do run the risk that you know, institutional shareholders will gang up and boot you out at the next meeting because you're not returning capital or doing some other thing that has a, a sort of stronger short-term return. So I think that shareholder primacy is a real problem. And I think that's well understood now. And particularly after the Financial Services Royal Commission, um, and that the company should be thinking long term. Yes. But I do think that it's important to um, have a look at where the power lies and to ensure that we don't always think of sort of directors as bad guys wanting to um, act in the short term. And in the event that they do want to act in the long term, that corporate structures or regulatory advice are set up in a way to facilitate that. Uh, and that sort of leads you around to the B Corp type structures that people are attracted to. And I, and I kind of get all that. Yes. Um, but I do think with the, with the current structures that we have, uh, it's important that the whole setting of shareholder power is understood. 
Yes, thank you. That was a really, um, a really fulsome response. Thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over to um, Kirsten because she is just going to briefly talk about shareholder, shareholder primacy within the context of superannuation and then we'll get to Phil and his question about the Hartley opinion. Absolutely. Well, I think Phil's actually just somehow dropped off the call. So while we're waiting for him, okay. um, I might just sort of say like one of the things that I am really fascinated about in this space is the idea of shareholder primacy. When you consider the fact that majority of shares of companies listed on the ASX are held by superannuation funds. So right. the superannuation funds are the shareholders that directors are having to act in the best interest of and superannuation yeah. funds exist for the benefit of their members. And so I think that sort of really closes the loop for me around the corporation, who it, who it uh, acts for the benefit of in terms of its employees, its customers, the broader community, who its shareholders are, and then the connection back between all of those groups. Mm. And so I think not just um, is it an opportunity for sort of better ideas, as Tim mentioned, it's also an opportunity for bravery of those who are leading the structures that exist today, for super funds to really take their responsibility seriously about being advocates for their members, both their members in their roles as members of the community, their members as they exist in roles of, as employees and customers of these corporations and use their shareholder power in order to create the type of world that is going to serve those members in the long term. Under that, can I just ask, yeah, can I, oh, sorry, Tim, you go, you respond. Oh, no, no I, I mean, I completely agree with that point. And, and one thing that's happening that listed company boards are facing these days is that more and more passive index funds are holding shares and they don't voice, they, they generally don't have that kind of strong engagement with boards. And what that can do, if, this, if super funds or other people who are, are managing money for people over the long term don't, um, use their power to advocate for long-term decision making. It can leave a void there where um, much more short-term focused people actually have an outsized voice because of the, the sort of non-voice of the index funds. So I just completely agree. I just think if, if you're a, a manager of money and your duties are to your unit holders and they're there for 30, 20, 30, 50 years, then um, absolutely it, it's, it both makes sense and it's also quite helpful for directors to hear that. Um, just quickly, for people who aren't familiar with the terminology, can you just explain what a passive index fund is? Oops, um, I've, I've gone along. Oh, there you are. Tim, could you just quickly... Oh, yeah, this is, uh, I mean... What a passive yeah, sure. Fund. Sorry, I've, I've, I've definitely taken this off topic. A passive index fund is um, essentially people put their money in and it's not actively managed per se, so there's not sort of humans necessarily making stock-picking decisions. Mm. It's a fund that usually works off an algorithm that just gives you an exposure to a certain part of the market. Mm. And, um, those, and those investments can be great and they, and they tend to have relatively low fees because they don't, they don't have that many humans doing things. Um, and if you want to invest your money in the stock market and just kind of go along for the ride, those funds exist, but, but what they mean for boards of companies are, you can have very large shareholders on your books that you don't get a lot of interaction with yeah. and you don't get a lot of feedback from. Right. And so what that means is that, you know, 50 years ago, listed companies, the stocks were held by, you know, humans, and um, they tended to be a higher link between the company and the community in that way. Now, if sort of 40% 40, 40 of the stock is held by these index funds, which is really common, um, it means that if you, you can have a relatively um, uh, small position in a company, but if you're someone that actually rings up the board and talks to them about things, sort of seeming relative importance is greater because that 40% doesn't express views on things and they tend to take their recommendations from proxy advisors on votes and they're just actually not particularly engaged in the day-to-day -day management of the company, which can be helpful but also can be harmful if they... Um, if the other voices that the companies are, are feeling pressure from are more short term focused. Um, okay. Well, if so, how much did you say was invested in passive index funds? Did you? Oh, I, I sort of made this number up, but it, it's kind of 30 to 40% in a lot of companies yeah. oh. and, and going up and going up as well. So does, does anything need to change from a regulatory point of view to take that into account when we're talking about encouraging investment in? in Green projects, for example. Well, green I, so, I mean, well, one of the, again, I really feel like I've derailed this, I'm sorry. One of the reasons I like um, the idea of the, you know, enlightened shareholder governance principles they have in the UK is because I do think there is a, a reflexive 
reaction in Australia that whenever they, whenever the government or regulators or community feel that there needs to be more regulation of companies because they need to be more closely aligned to community expectation, the way of doing that in Australia is to give shareholders more power. Mm -hmm. And I think that used to make sense right. when shareholders actually were the community. But now the link between um, shareholders as they're currently constituted and companies and shareholders themselves representing right. interest of the community is not so great. And so I think that in some ways that would be nice to be a sort of stand down where uh, regulators would give board some um, slack on some issues if uh, there were other structures to encourage boards to act as in the long-term interests of communities and stakeholders in a way that necessarily these days I don't think is always going to be driven by shareholders because shareholders can be pretty passive. So when you say structures, is that something you would need? Would, is, are you talking about socialising companies to adopt certain structures or actual regulatory change? Um, I think a mix. Like I quite like normative regulation, even if it doesn't have a, a sort of financial stick. I know that's kind of gone out of fashion, but to take an example, the ASX corporate governance principles, when they introduced the idea of the social licence to operate, mm. caused a huge amount of controversy. Mm. I personally think that a, a much better trade for both the community and um, companies would have been accepting that concept, um, making it clear that boards and companies do need to act with their social licence in mind, but maybe reducing some of the um, uh, penalties, for example, that uh, are available to shareholder class actions, because shareholder class actions, at least with respect to continuous disclosure issues, often don't relate much to community issues. And if I was a director, I would trade um, having a formal obligation to be mindful of my social license um, for a reduction in strict penalties for inadvertent breaches on other issues. So anyway, I could talk about this stuff all day, but, but I do think that the important thing to remember these days is that unless the super funds, let's take it back to what Kristen said, super funds are really the last bastion now in Australia of big um, institutional shareholders that actually can speak for, can speak for the community. And I think that they should, I, that's why I agreed with that point. Um, but I, I think that the assumption that keeping companies honest is done by giving shareholders more power is actually really flawed these days. And I think you've explained exactly why that is. And I hadn't realized that myself. Thank you um, very much for crystallizing that point, Tim. And I'm going to be doing more research on that myself. Um, and I, and I've just got a question there. Oh, you're back, yeah, Phil. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Good, good old Telstra. <laughs> Good old Telstra. I feel like it's the, it's the Kath and Kim episode, or the Telstra episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you wanted to ask a question, didn't you, of Tim about the Hartley opinion? Should we circle back? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so sorry for losing the thread, but um, I was just interested in what you're talking about, then, Tim. I'm just interested in the application of the business judgment rule. So, um, you know, I have a I have a view that um, you know a lot a, a much much bolder action can be taken. Um, than it currently is taken if we're really serious about uh, about climate change, um, both within the superannuation sector and and the business sector. But within the business sector, I think that there's this and, and the same superannuation trust is that um, you know there's an uncertainty about how uh, about whether. Uh, companies can take bolder action um, to, you know, to more radically, um, you know, shift their business and justify it on the basis of, you know, shifting community uh, attitudes, et cetera, et cetera, even if it might mean, you know, a few years or whatever. What sort of protections does the business judgment, judgment rule provide uh, if companies want to take bolder action? Maybe uh, explain, the question. Um, Kim, just yeah. explain to people what the business judgment rule is first, if you... If you yeah, can. so the quick download on that is business judgment rule is a defence from um, an allegation that you've contravened your duty of care and diligence. And what it says is, if you make a business judgment, and there's a few criteria, and I'll get to one of those, which is that you're acting for a proper purpose, um, a court's job isn't to second-guess business decisions made by directors. And so essentially, if you're acting honestly, you're trying your best and you make a bad business decision, you shouldn't as a director be personally liable for a breach of care and diligence. 
Um, the business judgment rule famously doesn't work for a lot of issues for which directors are um, uh, brought to task for, uh, usually around um, continuous disclosure or other kind of regulatory issues because the business judgment rule only works if you make a business judgment. So if you, if you just sort of forget to do something, don't do something, stuff something up, don't comply with the law, courts have found that that isn't a business judgment. Phil, I guess in your example, the way I see it at the moment under the current law is that um, directors have a duty of care and diligence. They also have a, but they also have a duty to act for proper purpose and in the best interest of the company. I think if you can draw a line, a defensible line between an action related to climate change or the environment and the interests of the company. So if you can make a case that in time, this actually serves the interests of the company, which is protecting or growing shareholder value over the long term, I think you'd be fine and you don't even get into the business judgment rule territory. I think the problem would be if you needed to rely on the business judgment rule, it's because someone says that you haven't acted with care and diligence. And so let's say you've decided to do something because you think it's in the interest of the company and it's ended up costing a lot of money and blowing up a lot of shareholder value and, and shareholders bring an action against you as a director. The question then would be, did you act for a proper purpose? And I think um, there's probably a point on the continuum where if the purpose you were doing that couldn't be linked closely enough to the best interests of the company over the long term. So let's say that you're a, you know, a company and you just went on a total flight of fancy and invested a fortune in um, a green hydrogen project that had nothing to do with what the company normally does, but you consider it to be in the best interest of Australia over the next five to 50 years. I think you'd probably come a cropper on the proper purpose test under the current interpretation of legislation. And if you come a cropper on proper purpose, you, you business judgment rule defense doesn't work because it's one of the building blocks of the business judgment rule. Right. So I think, I think it comes back to where, what Hutley said, which was if you can draw a link between the thing you'd like to do or the thing you'd like to stop doing and long-term shareholder value, then you're fine. But if you can't, if it's sort of so outside the purview of what this company should be doing or what people understand this company should be doing, um, then our law probably isn't sufficiently broad to allow you to do that thing. And the business judgment rule won't get you out of jail. A very simple example is, um, I just, you know, think so much could, uh, if every company you know, in this country adopted um, some sort of a climate change target and net zero by 2050. Uh, and at the superannuation level, if every superannuation fund adopted the same target, mm. um, it would just create such a dynamic within the the system in general uh, to um, you know to get to where we need to get to. Um, a lot of the reluctance to adopt targets, I've, I've heard it said, is that people uh, actually think it's uh, it's it's just they, they can't rationalise it on the basis on on which you've just described. They can't yeah. necessarily. So that it's you know, um, company, but, um, so that's where I'm. I'm sort of. So I think there's a lot of lack of education, lack of understanding out there uh, for people that may want to take bolder action, may want to you know run headlong into uh, you know in, into adopting targets. There's this re there's this reluctance, there's this resistance, and if we can do something that doesn't even need legislative change, it just needs you know, clarification. Uh, yeah. to say that you can do this, you are permitted to do this, and you have the protection of the law uh, mm. if you did this. Mm. Uh, yeah. I, I think you've law. perfectly articulated the limitation of the current law because you do have to be able to draw that line. I think drawing the line has become easier because of the regulatory um, prognostications, um, but you've still got to draw that line. And that sort of goes back to also shareholders still have a lot of sticks to whack directors with. So some conservative directors are concerned that if they can't make that case clearly enough, then that they are subject to a lot of liability, which is, is true. That's another problem with our laws as they exist now. I think as well, like in the age of social media and information transparency, these kind of decisions that are being made, um, when they do fall into the public domain, there is a direct impact on shareholder value through dropping, you know, uh, dropping share prices. And I think, you know, AMP is just such a great and topical example of this where 
the old idea was just this sort of cognitive dissonance of what happens within a company has to be for the purpose of uh, making money for shareholders and anything else sort of, you know, we're able to be willfully blind to that pretend that it's not an issue that we need to take into account. Mm. Um, 10 out of 11 questions that the CEO of AMP got last week were related to decisions around um, sexual harassment and the promotion of the executive who had had that sort of prior sexual harassment claim. Mm. And those decisions are, are having an impact on the share price of AMP. So it's not enough anymore to say, you know, can we please just talk about the results of the company? The results of the company are inherently tied up with the ethical, social, environmental and governance decisions that are being made within the company. Mm. And for better or worse, the fact that these things can be spread very quickly through social media um, makes those things much more uh, available for people who are making decisions about whether to buy or whether to sell and members of the public to actually influence the share price of these mm. companies. Justin, before we just we move on to the next section and there are questions I'm going to address to you, do you know where, whether Rio Tinto's share price fell significantly as a consequence of their destruction of uh, sacred sites, which has been extensively covered in the media? Uh, I haven't looked into it. Future Super is not an investor in Rio Tinto, so it wasn't relevant to Really? How I'm yeah, shocked we, to hear that. Well, we draw a very hard line, so we don't... No, no, I, I wasn't... I wasn't... Um, yeah. I didn't assume you were an investor. I just wondered no, if no. something you were aware of. No, I should yeah. look into it, though. It's a great question. Um, I certainly I'm, hope that they've been punished by shareholders. Yeah, I'm going to have a look at that as well. And for people who don't know, you can download an app on your phone, the ASX, and you can actually track if your favourite... Your favourite ASX companies, um, you can track them, their daily kind of movement, share prices and other relevant information. It's quite interesting. Um, Kirsten, staying with you, uh, superannuation, back to superannuation. So Future Super um, says Australia could fund the investment needed to reach 100% renewable energy by 2030. Hooray. Uh, with less than 8% of the savings in the country's superannuation pool, which we all now know is an immense amount of money, that total corpus. Can you just explain uh, what needs to happen? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And whether that this involves any regulatory change or again, it's about shifting attitudes. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the, the reason why we looked into this, this figure of 7.7% of the amount of money sitting in superannuation would be able to fully fund the transition to a clean energy economy was in answer to this question of it's too expensive, you know, like, how can we afford this? We need to keep investing in fossil fuels because that's where the money comes from. Um, and it really has been quite eye-opening for us and for sort of many people who've eventually made the decision to switch their super to be more ethical, to think about this idea that as Australians and people who are working within Australia, we have this tremendous amount of money that belongs to us. And unlike many other countries overseas, we also have the privilege of being able to choose who manages that money on our behalf. Now, there are some limitations, um, particularly uh, for uh, people who work within particular industries that might have EBAs or defined benefit schemes, but by and large, Australians do have the luxury of being able to choose who manages their superannuation on their behalf. Um, and uh, in the absence of sort of the things that we've already talked about, sort of clarifying director's duties, uh, clarifying the sole purpose test, there really isn't anything to stop um, superannuation managers investing in uh, renewable energy as an infrastructure industry that is uh, very high growth and has, you know, a lot of prospect to continue growing into the future as we, you know, especially if you think about the political ramifications around the Paris climate uh, targets and uh, the decisions that need to happen within the economy in order to keep Australia and the rest of the world under one and a half or two degrees of warming. Um, to, in order to deliver those outcomes, there's going to need to be uh, less energy being produced by fossil fuels, and there's going to need to be more energy being produced by renewables. Um, there's very little debate around that, um, but that would be a whole separate webinar if anyone wants to engage in that. Um, but I think what it really takes, like honestly, I keep coming back to this, what it really takes is bravery. And what it takes is thinking about the way superannuation managers act with a long-term view to act on behalf of your members. Um, the way the market sits at the moment within superannuation, and I might sort of uh, use Phil's framework that he talked through before, 
by and large, superannuation funds sit in that first category where they don't consider any kind of um, environmental, social or governance considerations. They're just purely chasing returns. Um, now, as I also believe, um, you can't separate the two and that will catch up with them eventually, uh, but that's sort of the approach that they take. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got a small number of ethical super funds, Future Super, Australian Ethical, Christian Super are the three sort of um, that spring to mind for me. And then in the middle, you've got uh, the, the ones who do take into account ESG, um, and that might be as uh, a lot of the industry funds might have ethical options within their overall portfolio, or others that might talk about the ESG considerations that they take. And then some that have started taking more concrete steps towards having targets. So HESTA and First State Super in the last couple of months have both announced targets around divestment of fossil fuels, as well as um, uh, emissions reduction, and in particular sort of uh, being net carbon zero by 2050. Um, but I mean, really, like if, if we as fund managers take the view that the, the world that's going to exist by the time our members can access superannuation is as important as the amount of money that we give them at that time, mm -hmm. these decisions start becoming a lot more easy. And it's not just about investing into renewables, it's about stopping investing in fossil fuels and stopping exposing our members' money to propping up a failing industry. Mm. Um, so I think that, you know, that there's a lot that sort of can happen in that space of considering not just the straight up, you know, um, view of do I think, you know, is the industry strong? Is the company strong? What are its returns projections? Mm. Um, but also thinking about how the political and environmental dynamics are likely to play out over the next sort of 10, 20, 30 years and taking those into account as part of the investment decisions. And that, to me, that is part of being a responsible economic manager um, for members' funds. And a lot of what we're hearing from all of you is that you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Actually, the current framework is, is largely sufficient, but it would be useful to tweak it, to introduce some amendments, positive duties, to help the laggards kind of get on with it. Since this is a really time-sensitive issue, we don't have decades and decades to decarbonise Australia or indeed the planet, we have to do it really, really quickly. You know, we're hitting up against our carbon budget. Um, I think by 2030, based on all the best available science, we're going to hit our carbon budget. That's, that's it. So this seems to be the tension. You could, you could do it um, if you were so disposed to do so, but uh, there are some attitudinal blocks and maybe the law could help push people over the line. Is that, mm. Do you think that's a fair summary? Yeah, I think so. I think things are changing yeah, as well. And, you know, Future Super and Australian Ethical in particular have played a really big role in showing that it is possible to have Absolutely. a strongly environmentally, socially governance screened portfolio that still delivers great returns. I mean, Future Super and Australian Ethical have been within the top five for the last six months straight, pretty much since coronavirus Maybe. has taken out fossil fuel exports, taken out uh, high polluting airlines, taken out pubs, clubs, alcohol, tobacco, gaming you know, those with environmental, social and governance screens on their investment portfolio have been drastically outperforming during this period of volatility. And, um, you know, I, I don't think anyone is thinking that this is going to be the last period of volatility that we're going to see. So more and more, I think we're getting data behind the idea that ESG considerations are as important as financial forecasts and in fact influence financial forecasts. And as a responsible economic manager, you can't ignore um, the ESG in favour of those forecasts. Yeah, and you make a very persuasive case because I've seen I've seen what your fund's doing, and it's very, very, very impressive. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, we've had yeah, a just to just to sort of talk about the um, uh, what you touched on is the law adequate. Um, mm. You know, so I always used to, you know, sort of, you know, say Australian ethical has been around for 30 years and, you know, nobody sued us for having uh, an ethical screen. Uh, APRA has always been comfortable with it all. Which answers, I think, one of the questions that's been asked. Uh, uh, and I guess I you know, often get um, responses to say yes, but yeah. Yeah, so your, um, your investors signed up on that basis. So, you know, that's different to every other fund. Um, so I, I guess what comes in, in, into there is sort of, you know, are, are the members, uh, you know, conscious and aware and, you know, going in uh, with the full knowledge of how you're going to invest. So disclosure and all of that sort of thing is, 
is important. But I think the the moves by um, Kirsten touched on, you know, First State Super and uh, Hester is really important um, to demonstrate that, you know, they've just taken the step of, to say, you know, this is, you know, this is what we've got to commit to uh, in order to get there. And, you know, APRA hasn't jumped on them or, or anything like that. So, yeah. you know, the, the law is there. Yeah. Um, I think, though, uh, anecdotally, uh, I know that there's still a lot of uh, funds out there that think they don't have that permission. Interesting. Um, so good, good on those two funds for sort of demonstrating it at a, at a big mm -hmm. fund, sort of mainstream level. Um, what would, uh, I, I just think even uh, a simple clarification from the regulator would go a long way. To Is someone from the regulator listening? This is... Yeah, no, it's the top it's of your wish list, Bill. Sorry. Is this the top of your of your wish list? A simple clarification about the law from the regulator. On that particular point, absolutely. Yeah. A simple clarification from the regulator to say that, that um, you can get to a target, uh, and that is not in breach of your fiduciary duty, would mm -hmm. go a long way. I yeah. think it would break down a lot of barriers. That seems like a really key point. Thank you. We've got seven minutes. Someone has asked a question about litigation, which is a perfect segue into my next question because it is linked to the use of courts um, in this space. So, and it's it touches on both superannuation and corporations law. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually ask all of you to engage, all three of you. So as you're all no doubt aware, and I know some people in the audience are because we've had at least one question about, about this particular case, there's been some interesting legal developments in Australia in the superannuation and climate change space. So notably, Mark McVeigh, who's a 24-year-old environmental scientist here in Australia, he's suing the trustee of his $57 billion pension fund, which is REST for allegedly failing to act with care, skill and diligence when investing his money, and for allegedly failing to act in his best interests, not by properly considering the risks that climate change pose to the fund's investments. So the matter's ongoing before the federal court. So first of all, Phil and Kirsten, I'm gonna ask each of you, maybe starting with Phil. So against that backdrop, backdrop what sort of test case would you like to see if anyone in Australia to push the boundaries um, in this space? And then I'm going to ask Tim about what sort of new initiatives you'd like to see to encourage green investment. And I think that'll loop back to what we started on before about regulation that affects capital investment. So I'll start with you, Phil, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, no, I think that's, um, that's a really interesting case and it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. Um, I think at the end of the day, I, I think it's really important because I think there's really sort of, um, you know, basic, basic things that um, for all of the reasons that everybody said that uh, funds that aren't, uh, that haven't got any process in place uh, in relation to uh, assessing and acting on climate risk is important, uh, is, you know, uh, uh, just have their head, heads in the sand, and I, you know, it's, I, I don't know, uh, you know, what the facts are, but um, or what you know what the outcome will be. But the claim seems to be that you know they uh, they weren't disclose they weren't they didn't have the process they they weren't disclosing um, they didn't uh, apply um, they outsourced their investment management so they weren't. Um, you know, applying uh, anything to the investment managers in terms of assessing climate risk. Um, you know, TCFD, uh, which is, you know, global framework that you might have touched on, on disclosing risk, they, you know, they hadn't considered that. So for all of the reasons that, you know, uh, the Hartley opinion outlined and APRA have outlined, uh, you know, if you're not doing the basics to mm. have some sort of a process to assess climate risk, you're, mm. um, uh, you um, are way behind. Um, so that'll be great to get all of that tested. Uh, and I think that'll, you know, um, accelerate things. I still don't think it, it potentially goes far enough. Mm. Um, 
and in terms of uh, I think you could still um, largely um, put processes in place and have a defence. Uh, um, what I'd like to see is uh, possibly something more along the lines, and I don't know how this case would actually, um, who would, who would uh, run it and who they'd do it against, but something that would actually test some of the concepts that we we're talking about, but um, uh, okay. to test the permissions around uh, what trustees can do. Yeah. That uh, fund, funds can actually mm. divest from fossil fuels, for example, mm. uh, or set targets uh, and mm. not be in breach of their okay. fiduciary duties. Uh, Thank you, Phil. I might just hand over quickly to Kirsten if she can. Kirsten, if you well, can. Um, so there's a second case as well in a similar vein to yeah. Mark McVeigh's case with a young woman suing the government about similar disclosures with regard to climate bonds. So all of us in this space are watching both of them with interest. Um, I think uh, other than those two, which I think are hugely, hugely important, um, I think there's an opportunity for sort of truth and labelling when it comes to ethics and advertising. Mm. And yep. um, just picking up on one of the questioners spoke to Unisuper as an example, they have a sustain a couple of sustainable options, mm. um, which really, you know, like, how do you define sustainable? Last time I checked, it invested in Rio, it invested in um, James Hardy within those wow. sustainable funds. So, yeah. you know, like they don't meet an ordinary consumer's definition of what is sustainable. So mm -hmm. I think there's a real opportunity for something around uh, testing that out and sort of saying, well, if you're going to claim green so credentials, I ethical credentials, um, yeah. you should actually carry that through to the investment decisions. What a great point, a common law definition of sustainability. I'd like to see that as well. Mm, yeah, fascinating. Really, I mean, a very fluid concept, so that means it's applied within the context of your industry. Um, last of all, Tim. So I'm not going to focus on litigation. I'll just say a couple of quick weird ideas that I have that I think would help. Um, awesome. So I think the current settings are, are reasonable in a way for existing businesses, but I think there's ways that they could government could think about turbocharging people trying to raise money to do good stuff um, and a couple of obvious examples are there's this thing sort of beautifully jargony called a regulatory sandbox for fintech businesses and so government has come up with a regime through the corpse act to essentially say licensing and disclosure is really hard um, probably not economic for new businesses in this space if they want to have a chance we'll give them a a way to um, kind of raise capital and try to do what they're doing. Um, Oop, Telstra's interfered again. Come on, Telstra. The planet's warming up. Minimal regulation, and that's because we've decided that there's very fintech businesses in Australia and nothing to do good to do good stuff. Um, we'll kind of let you off the hook of some of the hardest and more costly disclosure and regulatory regulation for a while. And then the other one, which is a clearly very weird idea that I am attracted to, is a lot of stock exchanges around the world compete for different types of businesses and they do it in a variety of ways. And other stock exchanges also have different, what's called different boards where they let kind of smaller or newer or more starty uppy type businesses list on a second board in a way that has less cost, less compliance, it's easier. And they say essentially we've got a priority in this space and we want to kind of give new companies a chance. And um, you know, in Canada they've been for mining, AIM is a market in London, people would know um, Shanghai, has a second board for science businesses. And I think there's a, a market where you go, ASX fantastic market. We raise more money during COVID than any other exchange in the world. We as a company, as a country decide that we would love to be the home of um, sort of impact environmental businesses looking to raise capital. Um, set up a second board, we make it easier for people to list and raise money and deploy their capital in Australia doing good stuff. So that is a very out there complex idea I try to explain in 20 seconds. Um, but I think it's it's it comes down to helping people raise money yeah. and take chances in yeah. this space. Is it would it be just quickly because we I think people will need to go soon. But it's fascinating. Would that be a difficult thing to do, Tim, to set up that second board with more of a, an environmental and social investing focus? Um, it, it would definitely be new, and and the ASX has thought about different boards for other things over the years and declined to do them. But yeah. it, so it, it's a bit of work involved. But essentially. Um, it's putting together a bunch of um, existing concepts into something that I think would be quite compelling. Wouldn't require a lot of legislative change. Um, so I mean, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be easy, but it wouldn't be that hard. I don't think if there was a will. 
Yeah. I, under, okay. I understand the Sydney Stock Exchange actually has a board like that. Is that right? Yeah, there's a, there's there is actually a few um, that have it, and there's one in there's one in Germany as well that's a specific exchange that just started to do it. Um, there's one in the US as well, but I think at least my view is the ASX brings with it this brand and this sort of depth of market that you could really move the dial and, and raise serious amounts of money. Um, and so I think that putting it together, that idea, and that's one of the things I was alluding to with Emma just saying is that the concept's not original, but um, plugging it into a, a, a major exchange like the ASX, I think would be an opportunity to have a sort of globally relevant um, exchange doing that. I'm going to ask one. I'm going to I'm going to exercise um, my prerogative and ask one final question, Tim. I don't know exactly what the percentage of extractive industries on the ASX 100 is, but I'm assuming, given given the nature of our economy, it's pretty high. Like a lot of them would be mining companies. Do you think they try and block that kind of a development, or do you think some of them realise they've got to get on board? Um, I don't think they'd try and block it. I mean, I'm sort of speaking of the cap. I mean, most of the people that we've had anything to do with are mindful of the fact that they need to um, to improve in this space. Um, and I think that this would, would sit off to the side and would be very much a kind of, it's like a baby exchange that sits next to the, the big brother. Um, so I don't think that would be the issue. I think the issue would come from Australia's regulators, relevantly here, ASIC and ASX, um, are very cautious with respect to the quality of companies and the quality of disclosure that comes to the market, and they come at it very much with a consumer protection lens. And so you'd have to sort of flip that here and say, look, with a particular, with a new board, we're willing to take a chance on things that may not ultimately, um, you know, meet the standards that we set for the main board, but we think yeah. it's worth taking that risk here. So I think it'd actually be, it'd be regulatory um, concerns more than sort of competitors. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. We've had a couple of other questions which we won't get to, but as I said at the beginning, um, we'll write something up and try and address some of those questions in that piece for Insight, which is the EDOS bulletin. If you don't subscribe to it, why not? You should. Um, <laughs> so, look, thank you, Tim, Kirsten and Phil. Thank you sincerely for giving us your time. I have found that extremely enlightening. I've learnt a lot and I'm sure our audience has as well. So um, have a great day, everybody, and uh, tune in to Insight where we will publish something which summarises some of the key points raised today and tries to address some of those, those questions we didn't get to. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Thanks Emma. Thank, Thank you, everyone, you for listening. Bye-bye.